Okay, we are live, and I actually got audio up and running properly <laughs> before switching to the main scene. So I'm pretty proud of myself. I can learn, I can get better, um, but we'll check back this afternoon and make sure I've done the same thing. So as a reminder for everyone, this is our first Thursday morning 10 a.m. stream. We made some switches, some adjustments to our schedule based on feedback, viewers, emails, Twitter. We took account, all those thoughts, and here we are, 10 a.m., so it'll be 10 a.m. Tuesdays and Thursdays. This afternoon, we do have a special event. Um, I say special just because it's not a regular time, uh, but it will be pretty special. We're going to Pendo, a local company here in Raleigh. Um, I know some folks that started the company that lead the Agile team there, so I'll be spending some time with them this afternoon. So tune in to get an understanding of what they're doing. We'll ask them a few questions around their Agile processes, where they are, where they're going, things they'd like to do, things they're trying to evolve to. It should be an interesting discussion, so I'm really looking forward to that. Um, this is also our first stream as a Twitch affiliate, so that was one of those magical things that happened when we get, got 50 followers, so thank you to everyone for making that happen. You'll see a bit more interactivity on the stream itself. I'm trying to learn and figure it all out itself, so there may be some stuff that'll be on this stream that might not be on the next stream, just as I try things out and learn what works, what doesn't work, what's too much. I certainly don't want to overwhelm and take away from the content, but I do want to make sure engagement is there. Uh, Mr. Eric, thanks for coming, man. Happy to see you. I didn't turn 50. I'm not 50 years old yet, <laughs> but I do have 50 followers. So, And Eric's one of them, so I thank you, sir. Good to have you here, uh, and it's exciting. It's an exciting time. I didn't think I'd get to 50 this fast, so all kinds of crazy. Whoa. That's not cool, Eric. I thought we were boys. Apparently, apparently not. I just learned a few things about our friendship, our relationship. Uh, it's apparently not what I thought it was. So, there's that. I'm not sure I want to take a drink. I'm not even sure what this is, but after that comment, I'm going to have a drink. All right, so that water was good. That's all right, Eric. It, it might just be you and me, man. It might just be you and me. Looks like we only have a couple here. Uh, but thanks for tuning in. Ooh, a PM? Like a product manager? Because PM often stands for a lot of things. Whoa! My bad. I was wrong. Sorry, man. Biohazard's here without an H. Good to have you. So, Eric, uh, PM role. Product manager? Okay. Is that going to be the first one for Transloc, or is that going to be adding to an already fantastic stable of product managers that you have there. Thank you, sir. Happy to have reached it, and you certainly were a part in that, so thanks a ton for that. Okay, so 3rd p.m. All right. Interesting. What is the split of responsibilities between p.m. and p.o. when your organization? Because I've been talking to a bunch of different people lately about that, and I have my views on what that split is, but I would be interested to hear how Transloc and the fantastic Eric, well, I shouldn't say fantastic anymore since he just took some cheap shots at me, how that Eric guy <laughs> rolls with PMs and POs over there. Be interested to hear from a lot of other people as well. That's one of those things I see a lot of people wrestle with and struggle and reorg and all kinds of crazy stuff as they try and figure out who they are and how to build out a product organization. Because it's a challenging thing. That PO role is so massive, so diverse, so challenging. If you really follow all the suggested expectations for that product owner role. Okay, so here we go. Ooh, big words conflated PO and PM into one role. Okay. So when you say you elevated your squads to be closer to the problems, does that mean they spend time with 
customers, sales team, customer service, all those things. Is that how you're addressing that? So you're doing the same thing I've seen other groups do with the Scrum Master or Agile Coach role is as those teams become more mature and they have the basics down, they start to expand their purview of where they're working and what they're doing. And that allows the Scrum Master to go and work on other teams or other initiatives. Um, but I don't think that Scrum Master should ever go away. Uh, but it allows them to maybe have their eye on a couple of different things. So I'm just wondering how you're doing that. Okay, cool. So that's how is the um, how's the team responding to that? Are they excited about it? Do they like the engagement? Do they find it overwhelming? I'd just be interested to to hear how that to hear how that goes because that's that's a lot of work. Uh, but maybe if you distribute it across the team, it might make it less painful. So that's an interesting interesting take. So for for those of you that are just joining, Eric and I are going through a chat around PM and PO roles, and he's doing something pretty interesting where they've, and to use his word, only because I don't exactly know what it means, but I can guess based on the context, they've conflated the PO and PM roles together. Um, and the team itself is starting to take on some of the PO responsibilities, which is a pretty interesting take. Um, and historically is not something I've done, but it's an interesting experiment that I'm definitely going to keep an eye on. Mr. Eric and all of his ways and trials and tribulations of going down this path. That's really cool. Um, that's an interesting Be So I assume they write the stories themselves. They refine the stories. And then using consensus they make those final business rule decisions or how are those final business rule calls made that's a pretty cool idea. yeah it absolutely is cross-functional to a whole new level that is a it's interesting i never even thought of going down that path and here we go Eric, trying new things. I'm so proud. <laughs> so proud of young Eric. Okay, cool. So the PM still has the final call because they're, I assume they're even closer to the business. You've done a lot of work to get the team closer to the business and closer to the problem, closer to the customers. But the PM, I assume, is that much closer. And that enables them to have the context or the additional knowledge or whatever it may be to be able to make the final call. And hopefully that doesn't happen that often. I imagine if you've got a team that can handle this and tackle these problems, they can probably solve most of the problems. Um, but having someone with that extra, that extra bit of answer, that extra bit of context. Cool. I tell you what, that's an interesting idea. Are you writing a blog post about this? Are you documenting it? Are you... Um, going to go on a podcast to talk about it or maybe a live stream or speak at a conference. This is some pretty interesting stuff that I think people might like. <laughs> oh, asking about my, sh my shirt. Uh, sorry. So if you, here, I'm, I'm going to, hopefully I'll give everybody a headache. So my shirt there is the Atlassian user group. So that's that's what that stands for. So for a while I um, I started the local chapter of Atlassian user group here in the Triangle area. Um, so I got all kinds of free swag and hosted a bunch of events which was cool. It's challenging. It's a bit overwhelming because there's a lot that's going on there, um, but it but it was interesting. So we were big at Lassian users at Dude Solutions a couple companies ago, um, and that just led us in that direction. And it was something that was actually missing here in the Triangle area. So I wanted to bring that in. It was a good experience. Uh, we had some fun times, but then as I moved on, I just wasn't able to to, to keep up with that. So um, some really cool stuff going on there. 
So I think Eric, you're getting feedback right here, live and in person on everybody's favorite Twitch stream, at least mine, <laughs> um, that it is good and interesting. And I think it's a cool experiment that you're trying that is, um, I don't know what the right word is, but off base, not off base like it's wrong, but off from the base of how everybody else is operating. So that's one of those things that the community I know would gobble up and would be interested to hear what worked, what didn't work, maybe what led you to go in this direction and how the team responded, how the business responded, how the product folks responded. Does product report separately from the teams and your agile practice? So that would be interesting if they all roll up to the same person, maybe the CTO, um, or if there's separate VPs, it'd just be interesting to see how you got there and you got the product team to, it's not the right words, right? But to let go of some things and allow the team to tackle it and let go of some of their responsibilities. Um, a lot of places that might be fearful for some folks, but it's good that you're in a place where it doesn't seem like that's an issue, which is exactly the kind of place that you want to be. Um, you know, Okay, cool. So that's, I think that's a big help. That product is rolled up all, all in the one. That certainly enables you to make some of those cool changes and try things out. Uh, some other folks that are maybe in a spot where um, they're separate orgs and you've got to wrestle twice as much, you know, to get things sorted out and get everybody on the same page. So that's definitely a challenge. Wow, Scrum Sarge, that sounds like a problem. <laughs> yeah, that's that's rough. So, um, so Sarge, they won't invite them, or they won't show up. Because that's often the problem is getting them to show up. Like I know both Bob and I, at various times in our careers, have had to drag executives into those sprint reviews by by their ears. You know, like we were their grandmother, and they just got in trouble. Um, it's one of those things where it's frustrating. People want that engagement, uh, but then they don't actually take action. All right, Eric, thanks for coming in. Thanks for sharing. Uh, we definitely need to figure out how we can get the word out about your experiment. And I do think it's a fantastic thing that the community would love to hear about. So I hope you find the best PM ever in the next however many minutes. Go get him, Chief. <laughs> So um, why can't you forward the invitation to those folks, Sarge? Uh, why can't you kind of take the reins there and say, hey, listen, we're going to invite stakeholders. That's how this ceremony works. The ceremony is about sharing with stakeholders. So there's no reason not to do that, you know? Um, Oh, I'd like to hear more about that, Eric. Um, so that's something we can chat about next time you're on. Be interested to hear about that. Uh, oh, gosh. Okay. I got you, Sarge. You know, that's an interesting thing. Um, at some point, though, and I know on some of our recent podcasts with the Metacast, we actually did one that talked about Agile coaches being scary. And... Sometimes you may just have to do that. You may just have to play the card of, this is my job, this is the ceremonies that are in place, and this is who's going to attend. And just get people on board with that. You may need to get to the point where you push people over the edge, or you nudge them, however you want to turn that. Um, but, that's, but that's one of those things where you've got to do that. Now that safety thing is an interesting thing. So if they're scared to invite them because they don't feel safe with them in the room, then that's a that's a different beast. And there's some other work that you're going to have to go through there to make that happen. So I certainly understand that because that, that is definitely a challenge. So it, like I said, it depends on the problems that you've got going on there and what the, and what the issues are. Yeah. So it's an interesting, there's so many 
dynamics around things like that that can lead people into scary situations. Okay, cool, sorry. Testing some new things out now that we've got some other things going on, I'm trying to figure all this out. So I'm sorry for not uh, paying attention there. So for those of you, if there's anybody that's new, um, please hit the follow button up top. It may look like a heart. Uh, those of you that are already followers, there's now subscribing and bits and all that stuff. So that's a, that's a, whole, nother, <laughs> that's a whole nother can of worms in the Twitch world. So we'll get there eventually. All right, so let's talk problems. Um, I know Biohazard is on. Uh, Scrum Sarge is wrestling with stakeholders not coming in, not being engaged, not being asked to be engaged. Engaged. So there's some there's some issues there. Uh, Sarge, I think that's something you're just going to have to work with and find the right place, the right time for you to just invite them. But again, if them being there creates an unsafe environment, then I think you're pretty aware of the work that you need to do to try and get that safety built. Maybe you just need to spend time with those leaders. And one thing that might work that I found is just being completely direct with them and saying, listen, you need to be in this meeting. My expectation is that you're in this meeting, but right now I can't invite you to this meeting because the team does not feel safe with you in this meeting. And here's why, here's the reasons, and here's how I'm gonna ask you to operate in this ceremony so that they do feel safe, they do feel confident, they do feel comfortable. So just some direct discussions may be the best medicine for you and your team to get those folks to understand because, and it's a bit redundant because I know I say it all the time, but oftentimes our job as Agile Coach just requires education. So my assumption is those leaders maybe don't know that they're creating an unsafe place. I am very hopeful slash expect that they want it to be a safe meeting. They may not understand that they are creating an unsafe environment. I myself have done that. It took Bob Galen to basically slap me upside the head and say, listen, dude, you got to get out of that meeting. Whether you want it to be or not, you're still the boss and people look at you differently. They behave differently when you're in the room. So you've got to understand that. All right, cool. Yeah, look, you're, you're, you've got it all handled. Sarge, you're nailing this as usual. Yeah, it's one of those things in culture, you just can't ever rest on culture. You just can't ever stop. You've got to keep going. Hey, thanks for following. Good to have you. Keep on rolling. Wow, man, Sarge, you were asking the hard-hitting questions today. This is what, so I'm working on engagement things where I can like give you like credits and points or something for asking these fantastic questions because uh, that's a really good one. And I don't have a real solid answer for why toxic cultures exist, even when people don't intend. Um, it, is it just lack of awareness? lack of ability to see what's going on beyond their little bubble, their little circle. Um, oftentimes, those situations, folks are very self-centered um, and they don't see and perceive that. I can tell you the lesson that I had to learn, um, thanks to Bob Galen and my wife, was that I was operating under this incorrect notion that my team had the same reactions to everything as I did. So whatever reaction I had to that, I just pretended that they felt the same way, when in reality they didn't. So it took a few wake-up calls from my, my boss, aka my wife, <laughs> and my good friend Bob to get me to realize and take a step back and look and watch and learn and understand how people were reacting to different things. Because I've built up over time an ability to just let things roll off my back. But not everybody was in a place to do that. Not everybody had the same path I had. That's why I'm so focused on now when I'm coaching and helping people, helping them understand 
that everybody's path is different. Yes, we all aspire to be agile, but our path to becoming agile is different. So we all have different bumps and bruises that we've taken along the way that have us a bit more guarded at different times. So there might be meetings where, from my perspective, I feel completely safe. And I have zero concerns about saying anything, but that's not true, not necessarily true, for the other folks that are in the room that have had a different path to get to that same spot as I had. So that was one of those good discoveries for me. And I feel like um, one of the things that's very important to me is being a good leader and understanding my folks. But even with all of that, I failed. So I had to learn a few lessons. And again, it was education. It was education from a good friend, from my spouse on who I was, how other people rolled. Uh, so I think we just have to continually educate people on actions and reactions, everything that goes into that. That's why I spend so much time with my teams, reading books, doing things, crucial conversations was key for us to get them to understand how their thoughts, their voices were received, even without the intent. So that's been a fantastic tool for us along the way. So I'm not sure that's exactly <laughs> why toxic cultures exist. Uh, I feel like if we figure that out, we could all write a book together and probably make a lot of money, go on some cool speaking tours and retire relatively soon. But that's one of those things that as an agile coach, culture plays such an important role. So you can never relax. You can never let your guard down. You have to always be on the defensive about culture. And actually, I think you need to be on the offensive about culture and keep attacking, keep getting people's mindset set in the right direction. So Sarge, hopefully that helps. Um, I'm sure there's lots of good, interesting readings. Uh, other folks that are out there would love to hear what you've got going on. Questions, concerns, complaints, ideas for Sarge. Um, for those of you that may be new, we do have a new follower today. Uh, my hope and goal is that answers don't come from me. In fact, I expect that not all the answers will come from me because I should not. <laughs> I know I don't have all the answers, but we do have a fantastic community that I love and I'm very proud to be a part of. So everyone's here to help. Cool. Oh boy. Okay. I got to read this one. So give me a minute. I'm going to just stare at the screen while I read. Let's read together. Okay, biohazard. My assumption is that that team is going to do work beyond that four weeks. What you should challenge the team with is understanding their velocity regardless of the project. When I build teams, I try to get them to think of themselves as a black box where problems come in one side, solutions come out the other, and they begin to optimize themselves and try to become the best problem-solving group they can be. And they really don't care what it is. They just know we have all the tools within our cross-functional team that's needed to solve any problem that could come our way. So I assume past this project, they're going to keep working together and they're not going to get disbanded. If they are going to get disbanded, then maybe it doesn't matter. But if they're going to continue to work together, which again, I assume that they will, then I think they're wasting some energy and some effort in not tracking that. I think there's some very valuable data that's coming in their direction that they're just throwing in the trash, flushing down the drain that could be used in the future to help them become more predictable, not just for their customers, but also for themselves. So they can be more confident when they take on a, a project or something like that, that they actually get value from that deep, rich history of work that they have. Otherwise, they're just wasting it, right? That's that, that's one of those things where you gotta take advantage of it. You got something special there. Use it to your advantage. Don't just pretend it doesn't add any value. And it, it actually doesn't take that much time and energy. I've done it with just simple spreadsheets with, you know, 
probably 10 or 12, 15 rows, depending on the number of teams you've got. Um, and just over time, tracking that and seeing and understanding things really will help you open your eyes about what you can and can't do. Um, so Biohazard, I was just asking them that question, like, hey, do you guys plan to work together longer than these four weeks? If so, then track it, dummies. Maybe don't call them dummies, but you know what I mean. So just get them to kind of have that, you got to be that wake-up call for them of you're going to complain six months from now that you're unable to give estimates when in reality you've been given estimates for six months, but you never actually paid attention to them. You never actually use them as a tool to improve the way you work, the way you estimate, the way you plan. So at that point, it's almost their fault. But again, that's a that's a common, uh, I'm going to word to use excuse, and I, I, I guess that's really it, because it is additional work. Um, it also might be scary to them. They might be uncomfortable looking at the results. Maybe they're slower than they thought. Maybe they're not as good as they thought, and they're afraid to have that data in front of them. Now, a good team will welcome that and say, okay, cool, I got this. And, and uh, holy cow, we've we've got to get better. We've got to do better. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to depend on the culture. Uh, I think you'll know after you talk to these folks a little bit about what their reaction is going to be if they get that kind of shock factor of holy cow we're like we get things done in in twice the time as we originally planned now they need to see that they need to hear that and then it's going to be your job to coach them along the way and not freak out <laughs> that's where you can swing in and say hey i'm on your side i'm here to help this is my job this is what i'm here to do uh, so that's that's an approach but yeah it's one of those things where so many times that excuse around, um, oh, we don't have the time, or oh, it's not worth it, all those things. There's so much little bits of data along the way that are worth it, but only if you do it consistently. If you don't have consistent data, then all that data becomes worthless. But I'm sure we'll be able to find ways for them to figure out and find all that data and keep track of it without losing their minds, because that can happen. Or that can happen, sorry. Okay, cool. Well, we are about halfway through. Um, I am going to have to duck out a little bit early today. Uh, I've got a few meetings before my three o'clock stream at Pendo. So as a reminder to folks that are on, uh, we will be on at 3 p.m. this afternoon. I'll be at Pendo, who, if I remember reading correctly, is one of those future unicorns. They're talking about them becoming a billion dollar company. Um, so they're doing some cool things. If you're building software products, uh, definitely look at Pendo. They have software tools that enable product managers, product owners, to get real-time feedback about the products that they're building and how their customers are using it. So it's a cool product, a uh, cool company, and uh, I'm looking forward to the discussion this afternoon. So tune in if you can. A revelatory. That's a hard word to say. So I've given this story before, um, and it aligns with some of the things that we've talked about earlier in the stream, uh, specifically around some of your questions, Sarge. Um, I was, <laughs> I can imagine it being hard to type, hard enough to say. Um, so I was leading a team at a small mobile startup and our retrospectives just weren't what I thought they could be or should be. And I was having a real problem with it because I had hired these people. I knew their agile backbone, their agile character was there. I knew who they were. I knew they wanted to, to do the right things. I just was really struggling with it and couldn't figure out how to get the retrospectives because that's my favorite ceremony that's how we get better um, but we just didn't have the engagement we didn't have the outcome it just, it just wasn't working um, so over a couple of lunches with bob i explained the problems and he said uh, like i said earlier in the stream hey dummy you just have to get out of the stream or sorry of the retrospective i'll get my words right uh, because you are the boss and whether you want to be perceived as the boss or not uh, you want to pretend you're a member of the team, you're not. And I had to learn the hard way the weight that my role 
as a VP carried, right? I, yes, I was a VP, but I didn't want to be perceived as a VP. I wanted to be perceived as a team member that was there helping them get better. That was my intent, but I was, I was actually contradicting that because of the weight that my title carried and the fact that everybody reported to me. So it was a little bit scary for them to have those difficult discussions and make those bold statements about ways we should get better, things we should be doing differently. So my presence was creating that problem. Then sure enough, Bob was right. When I got out of those retros, I stepped out and I explained to the team uh, what I was doing and why I was doing and why it was so important to me. Retros became what I hoped they would be. The team really accelerated. We became the product that we wanted to because the team got better. So that was one key thing for me. Um, the, the second was uh, when I went to safe training. So I went to safe training expecting I would hate it. Uh, Bob had come back from safe certification, I think, at that point, and was just railing against it. I was terribly unhappy, didn't think it was the right thing. Um, I joined a company and they declared they were going to be a safe company. And I was the guy leading the agile charge. So I walked in and it's like, hey, you're doing safe. I'm like, holy cow, I'm not sure I want to do safe. Um, so I went to a safe training class. And I went in there like a grumpy old man, you know, grumbling like, oh, this isn't going to be any good. I'm like, you know, wasting my time, blah, 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 blah. Um, but along the way, my eyes were open to a handful of, I'll call them ceremonies, that they have in place that I thought could be really fantastic for us. Uh, and they were. It took some time to get them in place and get the team to understand what was going on, so we ended up stealing large bits of what they call now PI, um, planning increment. At some point it was the potentially shippable increment, so it's gone through a couple different names of they've versioned their process. Uh, but we used that. We modified it to suit our needs. Uh, so that eye-opener of that class of, hey, wait a minute, this isn't as bad as I perceived it to be, uh, really helped me accelerate my team's the other thing was um, when I first read Spotify and that model, there's a PDF that was published, gosh, maybe a decade ago now. I'm not sure how, how long. And the thing that was an eye opener for me was what I call the nomenclature. So the naming that they use to demystify the term team. So think about in your daily life, the number of teams that a person is on. They, are on the software engineering team, or the software development team, they are on the database team, they're on an agile team, uh, they're on a product team. And so you say, my team, and then you have to go through the process of deciphering which team are you talking about. And Spotify's model provided labels specifically for all the different teams that person would be a member of in a, soft, in a typical software engineering organization. And that just I was like, holy cow, this makes so much more sense. Uh, and that it enabled us to remove a ton of waste. And that, that was just one of those things. I think back to all of the time I've wasted asking people, which team are you talking about? Or explaining which team I was talking about. So there are always interesting challenges that came up with that. Uh, I'll keep thinking about any other relevatory ideas that have come up. What have other folks... Uh, had? What other discoveries or lightning strikes have you had along your way? Because uh, it certainly isn't all about me. So for the other folks that are out there, what are those wake-up calls that you had? It would be interesting to hear that and understand some of the lessons that folks have learned along the way. Because it is one of those things where you, know, you operate in a specific way for a long time and maybe you have your blinders on when you shouldn't. And you're making some incorrect decisions or assumptions based on uh, incorrect history or um, misinformed history or just lack of history. And then eyes are opened and life changes. So hopefully you guys have some ideas too, because that would be good. Get that engagement going. Want to hear from you guys. Help each other out. Build a community. Do all the things we're here to do. Good as I drink my water.
<laughs> yeah, so I one of the things I've learned over the years is um, the retro is so important to me. And the reason I've discovered why it's so important to me is I've got a relatively long history with athletics. So I played uh, college football. And the one thing that you can never escape <laughs> is feedback at that level. So our practices were taped. People often talk about game tape and how the following day teams review tape. Uh, the following day we reviewed practice tape. So you are constantly reviewing your growth, your progress, your challenges every day. So every day you go in and you have a mini retrospective on how did I do yesterday? What can I do today before practice? Because we would have meetings before practice. We would watch film of the previous day and then that would cue you up for, hey, here's the things we as a group need to work on and here's the things that I'm gonna go work on. And that was a tremendous value to me so that's why retros are so important to me because I've just I've been conditioned through um, an environment that I was a part of for such a long time that that feedback was healthy. That feedback helped me become the player that I wanted to be and helped me achieve my goals and helped me do all those things and help the team win. Uh, so that's why retros for me have just become such an important thing because I really value um, what you can do with a positive attitude and a positive approach to retros. Okay, here we go. Scrum Sarge, he's in the game. Thanks, man. Happy to have you sharing. This is what it's all about. Yeah, you know, Sarge, that's something that I've struggled with historically is, um, as you just heard, that environment that I was in, that hard charging of, okay, yesterday's over, today's a new day, how are we gonna get better, what are we gonna do? And that tired some of our folks out. I had to learn that there were times where I needed to slow down as a coach and as a leader and let them take a break, breath. Yeah, sure, maybe I didn't need to take a breath, but again, like we talked about, not everybody operates like me. So then I had to learn what the appropriate pace of change was for our team. Yeah, that's a that's a good plan, right? So you gotta get them where they are. You gotta but then the other thing is you've gotta it's your responsibility if they're here, you've got to get them there. So you're absolutely right. The first thing to do is to meet them where they are and then provide those little challenges along the way to continually raise their game. But yes, you actually have to start them. If you come in and treat every team the same, you're going to lose them quickly. And it's not going to go as well as you like, and you're not going to be happy. You're going to get frustrated. The team's going to get frustrated and unhappy. All those things are going to happen. So definitely be careful. That's definitely a fantastic lesson that I know I've had to learn as well. I even had some other things along the way and similar other parts of life where like I had these expectations and somebody said well hey I'm learning too and that was like oh okay cool I can I can get on board with that okay well folks unless there's anything else I'm gonna wind it down I gotta get to some other meetings uh, this mid afternoon before the three o'clock stream I gotta get there a little bit early Make sure that's all set up because it's a foreign place uh, and you can never trust other people's technology. So I gotta make sure the network's good. If I'm on their guest network, that Twitch isn't gonna be blocked because that would be a bad thing. Uh, so I gotta get there early and make sure things are all set up. So that means I gotta back everything else up. So we're gonna have to end a little bit early today. So Scarge and Scarge, Sarge or Scrum Sarge. <laughs> and Biohazard, thank you uh, for being here. Thank you for jumping in and engaging and doing everything we got going on. Uh, it's an exciting time, and I look forward to speaking with everybody at 3 o'clock. Uh, and if you can't be there at 3 o'clock, we'll see you next Tuesday. All right, everyone, take care of yourself.